uh, Rehan Khan from Dubai. He's actually sitting there in Dubai talking <laughs> to us. <laughs> He's oh, part of, uh, there he is. <laughs> and this is part of our literature strand that we are covering as part of MacFest. I'm going to read his bio in a minute or two. But first, I want you to say hello to Jinsilla, my co-host. She's there with that lovely frame behind her. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi. She's our marketing wonderful lady. She manages our website, manages the technical side of these events and all the social media. So she's there to keep an eye on who's coming and who's leaving, etc. So we have roughly one hour for Rehan a 30 minute presentation and he's got gorgeous slides to share with you and really looking forward to that. And then we have about 30 minutes for question and sessions. Uh, do you want to say something about that, Jinsilla? The format for that? Yes, yeah, so what basically, Rehan's gonna be talking about um, his book and the different perspectives that we hear our history in. So I'm sure there's going to be loads of questions you have about, you know, culture. It can be emotional. It can be about what's going on today in the world um, as we go. So we're going to be muting everybody and turning off everybody's camera when he starts presenting. Oh, um, wow. but the chat box is going to be available the whole time. So write anything, any questions or any comments you have in the chat box as the presentation goes on. And we'll get to them at the end. Um, we'd love to have everyone like hand up, but we think it's just going to take too long. So, yeah, if you don't mind, keep keep writing those questions in the chat box as we go. Okay, so that's uh, thirty minutes for QA. Thank you, Jinsilla, for that. Uh, for the last thirty minutes, we are going to cover other things. For example, I wanted to cover the Black Lives Matter. Uh, I, as part of our literature discussion uh, to make the topic very current as far as literature stories are concerned. And I remember that one of my own stories uh, called The Slave Catcher actually talks about, describes black slavery. So I'll talk about that a little bit at the end after his hour and read a little bit from it. As well as that, I'm hoping that three of our future speakers will join us and they might say hello to us. And then we will make an announcement for another session for next week, which will be on Black Lives Matter. So I'll discuss that at the end. So for the moment, it's over to Rehan, but before we hand it over to him, I want to read his bio, mashallah. Now Rehan, he's a fellow writer with me in the sense that we're both published by Hope Road Publishing. He's an avid observer of history and the many cross-cultural connections it unearths. Rehan Khan has always been intrigued by how ideas move from one civilization to the next. Throughout his travels, what fascinated him most are the narratives, the myths and legends which unite cultures as opposed to dividing them. He is the author of A King's Armor, published in this year, 2020, and also A Tudor Turk, which was published last year, 2019. And it is this book in particular that we're keen to learn about today. Rehan will, will also read a short extract from his book. So welcome, Rehan, again, and thank, thank you, you for joining us. So over to you, Rehan. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Ginsella, as well, for managing all the IT. And thank you so much for everyone coming and uh, giving up your afternoon or your morning or your evening, depending where you are in the world at this time. So as uh, Qasara just said, in terms of the introduction, what I'm really interested in as a storyteller is are those ideas which really move from one culture to another culture, knowledge, information, how these kind of things are exchanged and particularly those ideas that actually you know, bring us together, those uh, mm -hmm. what we call uh, legends and myths that will actually you know, unite us in some way, that will bring us together. Awesome. Um, so for example, let me just give a, a few examples here. So take the Viking longboat, which I think you're all very familiar with and you've seen. Now, you know, there's more written about the Vikings in Arabic yes. than there is in any other language. 
So when I'm talking about this more written about the Arab, uh, Vikings in, uh, in Arabic, I'm talking about the primary sources, right. i.e. written at the time of the Vikings. So written at the time of the Vikings, there's more in the um, uh, written in Arabic in terms of the primary sources than any other language. And I'll come back to that a little later. For those of you who are in the UK or maybe who have visited the UK at some point, some of you may have come across uh, or been to this uh, cathedral, which is a Southwark Cathedral, which is just on the other side of the River Thames from, from the city. Now, buried within the grounds of Southwark Cathedral in 1736 was a chief of the Mohican tribe, Chief Mahamut Wayonamon. Now, one wonders, what is a Native American chief of the Mohican tribe doing in London in 1736? And why is he buried in the grounds of Southwark Cathedral? I'll come back to that as well a little bit later, just to get you thinking. Anyway, here are some, um, what I want to do is I want to give you an example of how essentially a story comes together, especially one of historic fiction. So I was with my family some years ago and we were walking through the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul. For those of you who've been there, you know, it's immensely majestic uh, palace and building full of so much history and culture. And we moved and we walked into uh, the room which held, which was called the Hall of Religious Relics. Now within the Hall of Religious Relics, I gazed upon this particular item, which is the staff of Moses. Now, whether you think it's the original staff of Moses or you think it's not, not the original staff of Moses, that aside, let's just assume for a moment, it is the original staff of Moses. And I thought to myself, how did the staff of Moses come to be in Istanbul? What was its journey? We know that the Ottomans took the religious treasures from the Mamluks before them in Egypt, but going all the way back, uh, how did it get there? Anyway, it was one of those things where you know, sometimes you think about something in life and then you kind of forget it. So I kind of forgot it and we carried on visiting different places in Istanbul and so on. The following year, I was with my uh, family and we were uh, cycling around uh, this particular place, which is Hampton Court Palace in Kingston upon Thames. And I hope you can see the picture of uh, Henry VIII there as well. But it was built by Henry VIII. And I remember reading at the time that Henry VIII, obviously probably the most famous uh, Tudor monarch and arguably probably the most famous English monarch there has been, I remember uh, reading about him that he used to walk around dressed like an Ottoman sultan. And I was struck thinking, why would a Tudor monarch, and Henry VIII no, uh, no less, why would he dress like an Ottoman sultan with a turban, and robes and, you know, why would he do that? And when I, of course, I looked into it, I realized that during the reign of Henry VIII, the most powerful man in the world at the time was Sultan Suleiman, the Magnificent, i.e. the Ottoman Emperor. And of course, you know, it's human nature, right? That what we do is we copy powerful people, right? We copy the rich and famous, which is why companies often will brand their products with a celebrity or a sports star or so on. And because, you know, we want to be like that. So we end up going and, and buying it and trying to live that particular story uh, as emitted by that particular cele celebrity or sports star. So during the reign of Henry VIII, he would dress like Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who was the most powerful man in the world. And so when I dug a little bit deeper around uh, about the whole why were the Tudors so connected with the Ottomans? I realized that many of the dresses that Elizabeth wore to court and that uh, you know, made famous in terms of the style of the period were actually sent by the Sultan's mother from Istanbul to Elizabeth. Um, and you know, food started coming in from the Ottoman Empire, from Morocco. You, you had the introduction of coffee. You had the introduction of you know, a, a number of different sweets and stuff uh, uh, arriving as well. And, in, in, in the uh, Elizabethan period, Muhammad al-Mansuri, who was the uh, Moroccan ambassador to um, England, he came, there was much uh, panache and he was greeted with, you know, a lot of acclaim and fanfare. And was it really uh, his coming to England that inspired Othello, uh, you know, for Shakespeare to write Othello a couple of years later? Maybe, maybe not. But certainly there was a massive in the 1590s 
cultural influx of ideas, of products, of items coming in from the East, coming in from the Ottomans, uh, the Moroccans, and the Safavids in Persia into England. The cultural exchange goes the, goes the other way as well, because Elizabeth then sends the organ maker, Thomas Dallam, and he was the one who made the first organ at King's College, Cambridge. He was sent to Istanbul and he built an organ for the Sultan, which he then plays as well. So there is a cultural exchange going the other way. So it's got me really thinking, what, what, what was actually going on? You know, why was this cultural exchange? Why was it that England's closest international allies in the 1590s were two Muslim countries, Morocco and Turkey, the Ottomans? You know, what was happening? Well, of course, we know that um, obviously you know, the Catholics of Europe had excommunicated uh, uh, the, the English, and as a result, they were very much isolated. They were cut off from Europe. I mean, it sounds very familiar. I know they were isolated. They were cut off from Europe. And um, in that time, they had to reach out and build commercial alliances with people outside of Europe. Well, I guess that sounds familiar as well today. And, um, and so they, they reached out to the Ottomans, they reached out to the Moroccans, they reached out to the Safavids, because that's where the action was. The action was happening in the East. And so it got me thinking, well, what would, you know, a fast paced action adventure story set in the 1590s look like? And I, I grew up, you know, watching uh, Mission Impossible in the 1970s episode, and obviously, you know, you have the current set as well. And um, it got me thinking, what would a Mission Impossible type of story yeah. look like in the 1590s? And I thought, well, actually, it would look something like A Tudor Turk, which is, which is the novel that I end up writing. So A Tudor Turk has been described, certainly by one reader, as kind of Mission Impossible in the 16th century. So that's where the story is really set. And I, I guess what it shows is that during, you know, the 1590s were a very unique moment in history. Of course, what happens is that when Elizabeth dies, then James I becomes uh, the king of, uh, of England, uh, England and Scotland. And as a result, then there's a reproachment uh, with, the, uh, with the Catholics and uh, there's less of a need then to have an alliance with the Ottomans and with the Moroccans. And so that, that kind of phase passes, passes on. But when I was doing this research, what I realized for my, certainly for my two main characters, and there are two protagonists in the story, Will Ride, who's a young um, Englishman, and he's grown up, uh, he was kidnapped in, from London, taken to Morocco, and he's grown up there, speaks Arabic, um, was uh, trained as a quartermaster. But he essentially, as an Englishman, comes at that time from a society or from a country that really beyond Europe, no one really knew who the English were. You know, most of the uh, uh, Ottomans would confuse the English uh, as being you know, a part of France, um, and, and as, would, as would others as well. So outside of Europe, very few people actually knew about the English. Whereas the other main protagonist, Awa Marimal Jamil, now she comes from uh, West Africa, and she actually comes from the Songhai nation. Now the Songhai were probably, or arguably, one of the greatest African empires there's ever been. They ruled for about 250 years in what is today kind of modern day Mali and across a number of other countries as well. So she as a character in a novel is someone who is trained in logic, in rhetoric, in mathematics, uh, uh, in the Quran, and in many of the sciences of the period. Uh, because again, her culture in the 1590s, where she comes from, she originates from Timbuktu, which was one of the centers of learning in West Africa at the time. And you would have Muslim and Jewish and Christian scholars passing through, sharing knowledge in the universities and in the, you know, with the scholars of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was an extremely famous place for scholars to come and visit. And of course, the uh, Songhai's commercial capital was Gao, which is also a thriving location. So really, you know, the character of Ewa, a West African in the 1590s, she comes from a highly advanced, highly sophisticated uh, culture. And so what all I was doing really in the story, and it, it may surprise modern readers, but really I was just reflecting the historical reality. What was the world like at that time? You know, there was a very advanced West African culture and there was a very um, less developed uh, culture in England. 
and, and as a country, very few people actually knew the English at all. So it, this kind of really begs the question, well, what actually happened then in terms of why is it that you know, African history has been sort of, I guess, um, you know, forgotten so much? And really, if you look at it, um, you know, when the Portuguese arrive across the Gold Coast in, uh, in West Africa, that's how generally Europeans start African history. They start with the arrival of the Portuguese. They start with the fact that um, the slave trade, you know, begins um, and so on. But, um, you know, if you actually look at the historical record, there are even Chinese uh, documents that have, uh, that are from 128 BC that uh, relate to uh, Africans from Abyssinia, which is an extremely advanced uh, empire at the time, coming in 128 uh, BCE, so before the Common Era, 128 before the Common Era, you had delegations from Abyssinia coming to China, right? So the Africans had been trading with uh, the East, i.e. With, uh, with the Arabs, with the Middle East, uh, with India, and with China for hundreds of years. And the trade between the 13th century and the 15th century was probably at its peak. But why then really, you know, I guess the question is, was Africa sort of put on the back foot after that once the Europeans um, arrived? Well, a couple of things happened. There's a really good book by Toby Green, who's at King's College in London, and he's written a book called A Fistful of Shells. And his hypothesis is, is twofold. He says, well, two things happen. One is, is that um, there's a in, uh, influx of what he calls soft currencies into Africa. So when the Europeans come, they bring currencies like cowries and shells and copper and coin and, and cloth. And at that time, these items were actually uh, currencies. So for example, even if you read the Icelandic sagas from the ninth century, what you'll find is that cloth is used as a currency. So it, you know, using shells and copper and iron and, and cloth at that time was not uncommon as a means of trade. The most basic trade, of course, was barter, but then above that, these were the predominantly the currencies. So the Europeans, uh, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, arrive uh, bringing these currencies in. So these are really soft currencies, and, and they're imported into Africa. What's exported out of Africa is gold and silver. Okay, so gold and silver, which is a hard currency, is exported out of Africa. That then connects, of course, with the trade from Mexico, uh, all the way across to China, where then suddenly go gold is actually, uh, its value, uh, gold and silver, silver's value is you know, appreciating, whereas these soft currencies that have been brought, imported into Africa, their value is depreciating. So over the next couple of hundred years, in effect, the purchasing power parity of the Africans diminishes because now they have an influx of soft currencies and the hard currencies that they used to have in their own country has now left that country and has gone outside. And so you've got that economic imbalance really, that's kind of one thing that happens. The second thing that happens of course, uh, you know, is, is the slave trade, right? So, you know, historians estimate that something like um, 13 million Africans in total were taken uh, from uh, Africa, predominantly West Africa to um, the New World, to uh, South, South America, uh, the Caribbean, the English took most of the slaves to the Caribbean, and of course, uh, North America as well. So you have, in effect, a highly productive, again, if you look at it in economic terms, you have a highly productive labor class of 13 million uh, individuals. Most of them were men, most of them were at the height of their powers. This labor force is leaving Africa and it's going to North America and what's it doing? It's generating capital because it's going to work in sugar plantations, in cotton fields. And so this labor, which isn't paid for at all, it's creating new value, it's creating new capital in the new world. At the same time, what's happening, and again, if you look at Marx's theory of how you know, labor movement and his book Capital talks a lot about this, at the same time, that labor is lost to Africa. So you have 13 million people who could have been highly productive working in Africa, that labor is now lost. It's not creating new value. And that labor has now gone to the new world 
where obviously it's being uh, used for free to create new capital. So in effect, you again, if you look at the history of Africa and what's happened from that point when I was talking about when the African cultures were you know, highly sophisticated trading, these are probably, uh, certainly Toby Green's hypothesis, is that these are two big economic forces. You have an influx of soft currencies and hard currencies leaving Africa, and then you have uh, labor uh, leaving and that labor obviously not being available for Africans uh, in Africa. So if that's the kind of historical context of what happens after that, after that period. And so when I was setting the novel up, um, uh, due to Turk, you know, one of the things you do at the start of a novel, obviously, is you have to look at what's the kind of trigger event, you know, what actually sparks the story, what gets it moving. So just to give some examples, of course, you know, in Harry Potter, you know, the trigger event is that Harry discovers he's a wizard, right? So suddenly he's no longer living in the broom cupboard under the stairs. He's now a wizard. For the, those of you who've read The Firm, uh, clearly the, the trigger event is when the lawyer uh, realizes that the job that he was, he, he's just landed with an amazing law firm, that law firm actually is working for the mafia. And that's the kind of the trigger. And obviously it's a crisis of consciousness now. What does he do? Does he continue working for the law firm because the money's great, or does he actually try and get out? But that has consequences as well. And of course, every James Bond film generally is, you know, the world is okay, a villain does something super awful, and then suddenly Bond is mobilized and, you know, get called into action. So every story has a trigger event. So in A Tudor Turk, one of the things that I, I did for one of my main characters, Awa Mariam al Jamil, who is our character from West Africa, is that I place her in a battle in 1591. So you can see hopefully reasonably well there, a map of West Africa. And uh, that part of West Africa that um, was under the dominion of the, of the Songhai Empire, which as I said, ruled for about 250 years and was uh, you know, highly commercially, intellectually advanced. What happens in 1591 is a battle takes place in what is today in a place in Mali called the Battle of Tondibi. And the Battle of Tondibi, the Moroccan forces of the Moroccan Sultan al-Mansur, they come down through the Sahara Desert and they actually attack the Songhai forces uh, of King Askia in 1591 at Tondibi and they, and, they, and, and they defeat them. But when I read about this, I had a bit of uh, difficulty, Never. I guess, trying to figure out why was it that a, uh, a, um, a North African Moroccan uh, kingdom, which is also a Sunni Muslim kingdom, why would they come down and actually attack the West African Songhai nation who were also Sunni Muslim? And I, I couldn't kind of you know, reconcile the two. It just didn't kind of make sense to me. And so I had to go back a little bit more from 1591. I went back to look at what happened in 1578. So what happens actually in 1578 is you have something called the Battle of the Three Kings take, that takes place. It sounds very Tolkien-esque, the Battle of the Three Kings. And this takes place in Morocco. And, and the, the deposed Moroccan uh, king, King Mohammed I, he gets deposed from the throne. Now, he wants his throne back. So he goes to his arch enemy, um, King Sebastian of Portugal, and cuts a deal with King Sebastian of Portugal and says, look, if you can help me get my throne back, then we'll come to some good kind of terms. So King Sebastian says, okay, great, I'll help you get your throne back. So King Sebastian now and King Mohammed I of Morocco, they then come back to attack the king at the time, King Abdul Malik of Morocco. And this great battle takes place. Uh, called the Battle of the Three Kings in 1578. And uh, on this particular day, in this particular battle, all three kings die. So King Mohammed I dies, uh, the deposed king of Morocco, uh, King Sebastian, the Portuguese king dies, and King um, Abdul Malik, the existing uh, king of Morocco, dies as well. Now, the, uh, the Moroccans are pretty much left uh, bankrupt after that. The Portuguese are left bankrupt as well after this battle because they've been fighting each other for decades. And um, really the Portuguese become a vassal state of the Spanish afterwards and, and really lose their ability to have their own foreign policy. And the Moroccans, meanwhile, they're, uh, they're also bankrupt. So 
their treasury needs a bit of a boost. So uh, the new Moroccan uh, Sultan, Sultan al-Mansur, looks around and says, well, how can I give my treasury a quick commercial boost? And the way to do that would be to attack the Songhai, who were uh, you know, very rich in, in, in minerals and in resources. But the thing that they hadn't done, uh, because they were, came from a very intellectual background in terms of the, you know, Timbuktu being a center of learning and so on, the thing that the Songhai had not invested in, they had not invested in the means of modern technological warfare. Whereas the Portuguese and the Moroccans who'd been fighting with each other for decades had actually invested in uh, modern cannons and aquabuses and so on. So then, you know, to come back to 1591, when we, we meet Awa Mariam al Jamil in the book, um, the Moroccans come down through the Sahara Desert uh, and they meet the Songhai at the Battle of Tondibu. King Askia of the Songhai brings with him 80,000 troops and uh, also brings 20,000 cattle, right? So he has 80,000 Songhai warriors who are armed with spears and arrows and swords, and they have 20,000 cattle. So you can imagine them as being you know, battle cattle, if you like. So they have 20,000 cattle. And um, the Moroccans only have 30,000 troops. So King Askio of the Songhai thinks that, okay, I, we've got a pretty good chance here. The battle commences, the uh, King Askia uh, uh, sends the cattle off to, to charge against the Moroccan lines. But the Moroccans have cannon, and the cannon you know, fire off, and what happens is that the, um, uh, the cattle get spooked, they turn around, and they come charging back at the Songhai. The Songhai army gets splintered, the Moroccans move in with their cannons, they move in with their aquabuses, the aquabus is the original kind of rifle, and they defeat the Songhai. The entire Songhai nation is enslaved, most of them are taken up to slave markets in, in North Africa, or, or put into bonded labor, and, uh, and, and their kingdom is, you know, is decimated. Commercial ca uh, capital Gao is decimated. The intellectual capital Timbuktu it never remains as, as it was. So when I read about this battle in, 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 in the history, I thought this is where I want to place my main character. And so uh, Awa Mariam al Jamil is, is essentially the trigger event in the story is that she starts in that point. That's where the story begins from her. And of course, uh, what it does, it radically upsets uh, her life uh, in, in terms of, you know, what's been happening so far and what happens next. Okay, I'm just going to take a time check. Okay, I think I'm okay. So um, then, um, so, so, so that's kind of, you know, what I use in the book. Now, of, of the two books that, um, that have come out in the last two years, A Tudor Turk and um, A King's Armour, one of the things, because they're historic fiction, I try and do is I often try and use um, some like famous and well-known locations for my settings. So for example, in a Tudor Turk, the, uh, a lot of the action takes place in the, um, in the souks of Istanbul. If any of you have been there, you'll know it's kind of a, you know, an amazing, magical uh, you know, nest of uh, shops and bazaars and so on. Um, and so much of the story takes place there. The, uh, for those of you who've been to Venice, you'll recognize the Rialto Bridge, and that actually opened in 1591, so I have that in, in the story. And on the top right, you'll see Leeds Castle, which actually isn't in Leeds in England, it's actually in Maidstone in, in Kent, but it's called Leeds Castle, which is a little bit confusing. But when I went to Leeds Castle for, as part of the research, and I looked at that moat, I thought, wow, this is an amazing location to have a, as, a villa, as, as a headquarter for for a villain, and so I placed one of my uh, villains um, in that particular location as well. And you know, for those of you who have visited Leeds Castle, I'm sure you would have seen some of the um, some of the some of the swords there from the Crusader period, and they've got you know Arabic inscriptions and so on on the swords as well. And of course, in the second book, the characters uh, travel east, so they go to places like uh, Damascus, which again, if you've had the fortune, good fortune of going to Damascus, which, which I did, I was actually there in uh, many many years ago in uh, December uh, and it was snowing and we were in the um, in the Umayyad mosque in Damascus and it was just it was beautiful but again the action takes place much more in the east so what I guess I'm trying to do with the stories is, is placing a lot of the action and, and the sequences around really well-known locations because it adds almost another character to the story so an example there from a Tudor Turk that's an artist's impression of London Bridge 
in, in around uh, the 16th century. Now, the, um, the original London Bridge obviously is, is not the bridge you go on today. That's the replacement bridge. The original bridge was, was shipped off to America, uh, I think in the 19th century. The, um, but this particular bridge, was, which is an artist's impression, depicts a bridge which is almost like a bridge town because you had buildings which were rising up seven stories high. It was highly, you know, tight and um, you had, um, you had sort of uh, uh, beams coming off the side of the bridge and the buildings almost like leaning over, being supported by, uh, uh, by these, uh, these beams as well. So I thought, again, that would make a great uh, location for a, a chase sequence, right? You know, there's a chase sequence on there and they used to put the uh, um, tarred heads of people who had been executed at the top of, of the bridge. So again, it creates another kind of you know, atmosphere when you're writing a, certainly when you're writing a fast paced kind of action novel. So one of the things I guess uh, you'll see when you look um, across all stories from all cultures, and this is um, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, around looking at different cultures and ideas is that every culture has this um, archetypal story, which is, you know, the hero's journey, which is, uh, you know, very much, uh, you've got a main character, something happens in their life, they have to go on a journey, they overcome great adversity, they meet a mentor figure, the mentor figure guides them, they help them overcome, uh, you know, life-threatening moments, they lose the mentor figure, and then they, you know, return transformed and, um, having overcome the great adversity. And if you look at the very first um, story that's ever been found, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, from the Sumerian culture, that's exactly the archetypal story that's depicted there. If you look in the Chinese culture, probably the most famous Chinese story uh, that's known outside of China is Journey to the West, which is a story about the uh, Buddhist monk Tripitaka going on a journey with three uh, demigods, the monkey god and two others, uh, on a journey to India to, uh, to receive the Buddhist scrolls and to bring them back to China. And of course, if you look at Persian culture, uh, you have the great work of the Shahiname, which is the Persian Book of Kings. And it's full of stories which, which have that archetypal uh, story of the hero's journey. And of course, in Western culture, you have stories like The Hobbit, uh, Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, which again follow that same archetypal uh, story of the hero's journey. So every single culture has this and clearly there's something there as human beings that attracts us to those particular stories. Okay, I just need to probably start to wind down as I realized I'm just slightly probably running over time. Just the last two slides here, that's the red and I'll, and I'll hand back to you. One thing I mentioned at the beginning, I said that um, there's more written, I said about the Vikings in Arabic than in any other language, okay? Now, the Vikings probably to most people in Britain are known as those kind of, you know, unruly uh, kind of raiders who came between the 8th century and the 10th century and they pillaged and they robbed uh, uh, Britain uh, and then they took stuff back to, to Scandinavia. But of course, they were the minority, you know, the majority of Vikings who left Scandinavia didn't come to Britain. The majority of Vikings, they traveled east because east was where the action was. That's where you know, trade was, that's where commerce was, that's where things were happening. And so these Vikings were known as the Volga Vikings. And having left Scandinavia, they traveled down the river Volga and um, they were known as the Rus. Uh, during that time, they were called the Rus. And historians speculate that the name of Russia comes from that, it comes from comes from Rus. And so these Vikings travel down there um, and their travels down the river Volga and then crossing Bulgaria and coming further, uh, further south and into the east, they came across in the 9th and 10th centuries across the arm armies of the Abbasid Khalifat at the time, which was headquartered in, in Baghdad or Baghdad. And um, initially the Vikings, you know, uh, is tall, big, brawny, uh, you know, brawny, brawny fellows. They tried to take on the armies of the Abbasid Khalifa, and they were completely wiped out because the uh, armies were extremely or well organized. Uh, and and the Vikings, you know, tried on a number of occasions to defeat them, and they were totally destroyed. So they realized that they couldn't fight these people, and so what they did, they decided to trade with the Arabs. So they put their weapons down and the Vikings then take up trade and they, and they start bringing down 
um, honey and they start bringing down furs and other objects from Scandinavia to trade in Baghdad or Baghdad and, and take back things like um, uh, silver. And so if you go to uh, museums in Scandinavia today, particularly in Norway and, and places like that, you'll find um, thousands and thousands of Arabic coins there because these are coins that were uh, brought by the Vikings from the Arab world into Scandinavia in the 9th and 10th century. Probably the most famous of the Arabs who uh, uh, spent time with the Vikings was Ahmed ibn Fadlan. Uh, and he was a diplomat in the 10th century in Baghdad. And there were many others, but he was probably the most famous one. Um, and he's probably most famous because his, uh, his Risala or his um, a book about his journey with the with the with the Vikings uh, ha has survived, and um, uh, Michael Crichton, who as many of you will know because he wrote Jurassic Park, of course, and one of his other books was Eaters of the Dead, and it's a fictionalized tale about the story of Ahmed ibn Fadlan and his journey with the with the Vikings. And there was a particularly bad movie in the 1990s with Antonio Banderas called The Thirteenth Warrior, which was about that. But if you want to know, know more about the Arabs and the Vikings, then certainly go to the 1001 Inventions uh, website. There's a lot there. Um, and also there was um, a really great uh, program on uh, In Our Time with Melvin Bragg some years ago about the Volga Vikings. So, you know, there's a lot there, which again shows the fact that uh, even there are these sort of connections that we wouldn't think there would be connections between Vikings and Arabs, uh, but there is a lot of connection there because, you know, in shared stories, shared myths, and shared, you know, commercial uh, arrangements between the two. So let me finish off then by saying that um, at the beginning I said that in Southwark Cathedral in London is buried a, a chief who was called Chief Mahomet Wayonamon. And he died there in 17, he came to England in 1735 to petition King George II at the time to say, look, the settlers uh, who are coming to America are uh, taking our land this is spiritual land, it's holy land, uh, and they're, you know, they're throwing us off our land. We're happy to share, but you, you, they're taking our land from us. And so uh, Chief Mahomet uh, Wayonamon of the Mohican tribe came to London in 1735 with uh, 11 other chiefs. They came to petition King George II uh, uh, about this. The king refused to meet them, said, I'm not meeting them. And unfortunately, uh, the chief and the other chiefs, they all contracted smallpox and they died. And, and, and you know, um, they never met the king. So in recognition of that, uh, Queen Elizabeth I in 2006 uh, met with the descendants of uh, Chief Mohammed Wayonamon of the Mohican tribe and very kindly opened a memorial uh, uh, and to mark really where they think his grave is. So if you go to Southern Cathedral, uh, go through the cathedral, uh, going to the gardens in the back, and you'll see uh, that monument there, and you'll see the plaque to Chief Mohammed uh, Wayonamon as well. And um, so it's there, and, and so he's buried, buried in that area. Now, for those of you who speak French, you're probably thinking, I mentioned that his name is Chief Mohammed Wayonamon. Now, of course, those French speakers amongst you will know that Mohammed is the French for Muhammad. Okay, so his name was Chief uh, Muhammad Wayonamon. Now this begs another question. Why is a Native American chief called Muhammad? I mean, what have the Native Americans got to do with the Muslim world? Well, again, if you look into the history, um, we know that between 1500 and 1800, during those 300 years, something like 2.5 million European settlers uh, went to North America. Uh, they took with them forcibly 12 million African, uh, Africans, uh, about a third of which were Muslims uh, from West Africa and other places. Um, and during that same period, American historians estimate that between 1500 and 1800, something like um, 50 million uh, Native Americans were, were wiped out, they were killed um, through being hunted down uh, or through disease like smallpox. And even their animals, like the buffalo was a deeply spiritual animal for Native American Indians. Uh, and when the settlers got there, European settlers got there, there was something like 23 million uh, buffalo. Uh, and, and, you know, the, uh, 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 
Native American tribes used to follow them and, and, and there was deep respect between them. You know, the buffaloes came down to about 23, from 23 million down to about 23. Now, due to the work of Native American tribes, that's up to about 3,500 3, once more. But anyway, I'm digressing there slightly. But um, so you have about uh, a major sort of wipeout of the Native American community. But we also know uh, from uh, rock records in the Library of Congress that there were African Americans who married with Native Americans. And so some of those African Africans who married with Native Americans were Muslim as well. And so it doesn't, you know, uh, you know it does, it's not such a, a big leap or it, it's a very sound theory in, in many ways, whereby the children of those who were African uh, Muslim, uh, you know, who'd come from uh, uh, Africa to America and Native Americans who'd married, their children would be uh, Muslim, in, you know, at least in, in partly in name as well. And so Chief Muhammad uh, Wayanamon or Chief Muhammad Wayanamon, you know, theory is that he may have come from one of those, maybe a descendant of one of those marriages. And even today, if you go to Illinois in the US, and obviously don't tell the existing president, but if you go to Illinois in the US, there is a small town of 50,000 people called Muhammad uh, Wayanamon uh, or, or, or Muhammad. There's a town uh, called Muhammad. You can look it up on Google Maps, uh, but it's there. So, you know, this history, if we just dig around a little bit, uh, you know, we can find these cross-cultural cultural connections. And, and really what that does is that it really leaves us feeling that the myths, the legends, the stories that we have between us around the world are things that actually bring us together. You know, our differences are there to maybe challenge us, but they're also there uh, to bring us together. And I, and I guess that's my key message in terms of the novels I'm writing are often about people who come from different backgrounds, who need to work together uh, to, you know, uh, achieve a common goal. And clearly, if we, if we look beyond just the surface, if we scratch a little bit deeper in history, we'll find that there are much more in common between us then there is uh, uh, you know, things of difference. So um, I think I've gone over my time there, that's right. So I will stop uh, because I know we need to give time for uh, questions as well. So I'll unshare my screen. So back to you, Khasra, to, to, and uh, Jinsela. Jinsela, uh, can you switch me on, please? Yeah, I've just... Um, okay, thank you. ...asked to start videos. I think you need to just accept that. Okay. Wow, Rehan, mashallah, that was magnificent. Thank you so much. Really, really loved it. I learned so much. And thank you in particular for relating to Africa, the trade, the connection. You know, it went beyond mashallah literature. It was amazing. I really loved it. Now we've got about 20 minutes and part of that is question answers, but also a little bit of reading. Remember we said you read something. Are you able to do that for us before the questions? Yeah, let me read something then. I, yeah, let me read something. I'll just uh, read one. I'm going to read one paragraph. I'm not going to read uh, too much. That's it. Um, That's all what I'd like to do is maybe let me read a paragraph which summarizes the book. So, Thank you so much, Rahan. So this is, a, um, this is a paragraph towards the end of the book, and it's between uh, the villain, uh, uh, the Earl of Rothminster, and also one of the main uh, characters, uh, Commander Konyek, who is Bosnian. So it's just one paragraph. Rothminster surveyed Konyak with a penetrating gaze. You strike me as a good man, Commander, but where the good are put in place of the wicked, empires will be destroyed. It is when the wicked are given oversight of the good does empire become strong. I would beg to differ with your kind of politics, said Konyak. Rothminster took a step closer to him. My type of politics leads to a clash of religions, a clash of cultures, and a clash of races. Your type of politics unifies under an imperial cause. In the end, I will win because dividing and conquering is far easier than unifying the hearts of men. And that is exactly the point. Dividing and conquering is easy. It's easy. 
And as human beings, we can take the easy route out and we can try and divide and conquer, or we can actually make a bit of effort and try and bring people together. And that's really what the book is talking about. Okay, thank you, uh, Rehan, for that. Now for questions, is there anybody who wants to start us off? Anyone? Put up your hand if you can see your hand, or you send us a little chat question. Anyone? Hi. <laughs> is there anybody who'd like to start? Otherwise, I will ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, no, yes, uh, he said that the uh, king of what's called uh, king of Morocco went to fight in Somalia. Geographically, you, there is five countries, and Asia, and Sudan is there. Without resistance, he went to fight Somalia. Is that, you know, without the knowledge of the uh, the uh, Ottoman buyers, because the head, court, yeah, the, the we call it the uh, the uh, Cairo, it was the main place for the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. So yeah, right for so, me. Sure. So the feast of the qu so thank you very much for that. So just to maybe clarify, what I said was that the Moroccans travelled uh, across the Sahara Desert uh, to attack the Songhai. The Songhai is in modern day Mali. It's not in Somalia. Somalia is the east coast of Africa, but the Songhai were the west coast of Africa. So obviously if you look at the map uh, from the uh, Maghrib, you just travel through the Sahara Desert and then you're into Mali. Uh, uh, and that's where they, they travel through, yeah. Okay, thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Nafisa. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, who is this? Any more questions? Otherwise, Rahan, uh, yeah, I want, yeah, go Hanan. on. Hanan. Hanan. Yes. Can uh, we see you, Hanan? Did you did you see me? I can't see you. I want every I want to see everybody. If you can show me your faces, if okay. you can, it'd be lovely oh, no. to see you. But I, I need to be say that to to, to uh, open my camera. Okay. Oh, yeah. Ah. Uh, because I'm, I read the, I read your book. It's very 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 nice book. This is the way I want to thank you more, lot of for, uh, firstly for doing uh, our uh, meeting, Macfest meeting, and with uh, your valuable literary participation, really. Uh, I, I was interested to read your book because um, I'm intrigued by historical aspects. In the same time, uh, uh, by adventure, especially with the, your writing is fully of rich description and the, and the deep details. This intrigued me and uh, I was very excited to continue the book all the time. I don't need to stop. Yeah, uh, I strongly believe that the cultural and the political issue, uh, like trade, route, and the war technique, in the same time the religion believes, uh, gives me this sensation that I am in marvelous era of Istanbul, in Venice, in Leeds, in Morocco in the same time, because Morocco is my country. Okay. With the description of... Uh, of uh, the, um, the uh, dynasty al muwahidin because it was very, very empire. At the same time, led by El Mansour. In this time, uh, Morocco is very rich country because uh, um, the, the country succeeded by huge alliance with different countries. Um, in the same time, the impressive, the impressive uh, changement in the um, integral situation of will and our kept me more engaged to know more how the, their lives changed uh, in, in just a few time by taking hope, by, uh, by, uh, by giving more this relationship between friends and uh, really, really, it's a very nice book. 
Okay, Rehan, question for me then about your right. writing life. Okay. Tell me what, what got you into writing and what I was, made... Sure. Yeah, no, so I was like, uh, like many of you, uh, when I was at primary school, uh, I was, you know, curious. I, my mother always used to say, I think she's on the line, actually. My mother oh. always used to say, you're always asking why, why this, why that? And, you know, that's really, I think that's really great for children to do because, you know, uh, there's a saying that, you know, children until the age of three or four, all children are philosophers because they ask why. But unfortunately, when they end the, enter the modern education system, you know, that, unfortunately, that's kind of beaten out of them, unfortunately. But, but yeah, so I was always very curious and I used to uh, write stories and I had a, a teacher from uh, Beverly Hills, California, who came in an exchange uh, year and uh, she really inspired me and, you know, got me writing. And I remember writing a story um, about one of my friends whose house was being burgled. And this was in 1980, so I was nine at the time. And uh, he then, my friend Andrew, set up all these traps around the house to, to stop the burglars coming in because his parents weren't there. And it very much sounds like the, you know, the treatment for Home Alone, right? So my teacher was from Beverly Hills, California, so maybe you know, she developed that into a film script, I don't know. But anyway, so that was something which um, got me interested. But then uh, I kind of lost that track of writing and uh, my interest there. And it wasn't really until about um, 2009 when my uh, daughter, who was six at the time, we were sitting at, at breakfast and she said to me, she said, uh, Abu, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> now, of course, I was someone working. I had a you know, re reasonably successful career. But in her view, I didn't really do anything. I kind of went to the office and just did something. Yeah, you know, I wasn't like a doctor. I wasn't like a fireman. And that was really something I couldn't answer. And, and it was one of those moments in life where you go into deep reflection and it's like a turning point. And when, whenever we have like a turning point in life, never rush, stop mm -hmm. and really reflect. And it got me really thinking about it. And uh, I thought, well, I, I always wanted to be a writer, right? So then it got me on that journey and I started down that journey. Um, yeah, so a thank you to my daughter and thank you to my oh, old school. That's, that's really nice, so sweet. <laughs> right, we've um, got 15 minutes, so please make the most of it, everyone. Patsy, you want to say anything? Just yes, to say, I found question. this so interesting. I mean, as you've said, those connections being made and to have that strong female character sounds really interesting as well. Um, just, I w was not aware of any of those links at all. Completely different view of the Vikings. Totally fascinating. And that, that lovely message that we're all so connected to each yeah. other. It yeah. sounds amazing. Can't wait to read it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder okay. if that, and thank you. You took us from the old history. We went to Morocco. We went to America. We back. <laughs> Yes, and this is fantastic, you know, to we even uh, went to Baghdad. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the magic, uh, the magic carpet or what okay. you call it. So that's, you know, refresh our memory because, I, you know, my main study is history, political and history. And you gave us kind of spice, lovely way to remember all those days. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. thank you. I want to ask people who've not asked already first, if you're not spoken and you want to ask a question, please do ask. Some of our new guests. Come on, there must be a question there. <laughs> Otherwise, I know my uh, my team is already waiting. Gentilla, do you want to ask a question? I'd, I'd like to ask one more. Well, go and on then. <laughs> I've never come in before, so this is my first question. Um, have you always lived in Dubai? And how much of a sort of writing scene is there in Dubai? Yeah, so no, I actually grew up in, uh, in South London, in Wimbledon. And... Um, 
so land of the wombles and tennis and all that kind of stuff. And um, so uh, we've been in Dubai uh, for about since 2006. Um, and over here, we've got a very, a very mature literature festival, the Emirates Airlines Festival of Literature. And if you speak to any of the writers, you know, the global writers around the world, everyone wants to come here because they fly you out business class and really take care of you. So it's a really um, well-funded, uh, uh, amazing festival. And I, I guess because of that, and the fact that I've been moderating there and hosting, and the last couple of years I've been there as an author, uh, that's, uh, it's, it's an amazing community. So Isabel Abuhu, who, who started the festival up, um, uh, she's done an amazing job, her and her team. So it's quite a thriving writing community here, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like to add yeah. Okay, I um, totally agree with you. I was there at the first festival and mashallah, you know, first class we were offered me and my son and the hotel we stayed in, my goodness, thousand of pounds worth. It, it treated us beautifully, really, really good. Uh, Steve, would you like to ask a question? Are you special joining Steve Roman? Yes. Um, you can't hear talk that, that, um, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can hear you. Yeah, there was such a clear talk. I don't actually have any questions because <laughs> it made perfect sense and it was fascinating um, yeah. to hear history from a totally different perspective, but yeah. in a wonderfully circular way that made so much sense. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Pfizer, would you like to ask a comment? I'm trying to involve a new Participants today, particularly. Faiza, would you like to say something or a Zahra? Oh, yeah, actually, I had a question. Um, so oh. basically, I mean, you know, in um, your previous uh, book, Rehan, and then in this series as well, like there's always a strong female protagonist. Um, I mean, you know, um, that might have happened, might not have happened. Like, you know, in the history, it was mostly male dominated. <laughs> Are you trying to uh, bring this message across to the newer generation that, you know, women should come forward, um, you know, as strong characters? Yeah, no, thank you. It's an excellent question. So, look, I think, again, if you look at the history, or especially history in the Muslim world, uh, it was always, uh, women have always played a major role uh, in the Muslim world, okay? So, for instance, uh, commercially, you know, Muslim women businessmen built some of the greatest educational institutions in the Muslim world, the Al Arawin in, in Fez in Morocco was financed by a Muslim businesswoman. The Al Azhar in Egypt was financed by a Muslim uh, businesswoman. The first mosque in the UK, or arguably the first mosque in the UK, Woking, was financed by the Begum of Bhopal, a Muslim businesswoman. So, in the Muslim world, if you look from a commercial perspective, you know, Muslim women have always played a leading role. Um, if you look at it from a scholarly perspective, uh, I think um, this scholar in uh, Oxford, um, his name is Sheikh uh, Nadwi, Akram Nadwi, I think, and he's put together a, uh, like almost like an almanac of Muslim women scholars. And when he started the work, he expected to find a few hundred. And as he's been doing this, it's like a lifelong project. He's discovered about 50,000 uh, Muslim women scholars. I think I'm pretty sure 50,000 is the right number. It's a huge number of Muslim women scholars. Again, you, then you kind of ask, well, why did that change in the Muslim world? Well, it changed throughout um, all of those countries that were colonized, because when the, uh, the uh, colonial powers came in to uh, many parts of Africa, uh, where there were strong uh, uh, tribal uh, and women leaders as well, in many parts of the Muslim world, the colonial powers at the time, the European powers, their societies were highly patriarchal. And so they imported that patriarchy into the East. And as, these, uh, as the Eastern countries became colonized and they took on board the trappings and the philosophy and the learning of the West, which is a patriarchal society at the time, they became consumed in patriarchy. And you'll see again, patriarchy always flourishes when there's a power imbalance. You know, society that's healthy it's not patriarchal, but a society where there's a power imbalance and the weakest in terms of, you know, physically weakest, if you imagine, uh, people uh, where there's an imbalance of that, that becomes a patriarchy. So really in terms of the, hist if you look at it from a historical perspective, 
there's always been strong Muslim women uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, in commerce, in academia. So once more, all I'm doing is I'm just trying to reflect a historical reality and just saying to people, look, think, you know, this is actually what's going on. Okay, thank you. Mariam, I'd like to bring you in. Mariam? Okay, assalamu alaikum. I well, totally enjoyed your um, presentation, uh, which uh, it, it um, resonates really well with me, especially with the fact that you brought in Africa and um, the history about the slave trade moving on to um, America and all that. And also, I'd like to ask you um, for like any advice that you have for me, because I enjoy reading. It's like my most like that's the only hobby that I do. I, I can read the whole day, any type of book, anything. But then I also think that because I I read a lot, like I should be able to write something. But then when I start writing, like I, the, uh, those things that I lack ideas, like I end up writing like mostly cliche stories, nothing like really creative that will actually like stand out. So like, what advice will you give me in like trying to like? Yeah, no, perfect. Great question. So look, I, I mean, the great thing is that because you're a reader, uh, you can be a writer. You know, every writer is a reader first and a writer second. So that's excellent. Great start. You know, it's the people who say I want to write and they don't read. And that, that's what is worrying. So that's great. So in terms of uh, the thing that you really need to do is you need to do a bit of planning. So when I wrote my first novel, uh, which was uh, self-published, um, I spent about 30% of my effort on designing the novel. And I spent 70% of it writing the novel. So even the novels now, like A Tudor Turk, I typically spend about 20% of the time designing the novel. So you think, well, what does that mean? What do you mean by design? So design means thinking about, okay, where is your story set? You know, is it in the future? Is it in the past? Is it in the present? What's happening in the world around it? What's the power like in that world? You know, who has power? Who doesn't have power? You know, what's the, uh, you know, what's going on in that society? What's happening in, you know, in, in societies nearby? So really establishing your setting. And if you can put some conflict into your setting, maybe there's a war happening, or maybe there's a natural disaster happening, then as human beings, we like to read those stories. Because what that conflict does it creates in us an emotional response. You, know, you only read a book it, and you enjoy it if you get an emotional response. And if you as a writer can put conflict into your story, then me as a reader, I'll get the emotional response. So first of all, spend time designing your setting, then design your characters. You know, who are they? Where do they come from? How many uh, brothers and sisters do they have? What's their background? What's their life biography? What do they want? Spend time doing that. Then spend time thinking about what's the kind of plot? What type of story am I writing? Am I writing a, like, a, like a quest story? You know, the characters have to go off, they have to find something, and then they have to come back. Am I writing a kind of uh, voyage and return story, like the Chronicles of Narnia, for example? They go on this journey and they come back, and they come back with the experiences. Am I writing like a tragedy, like you know, uh, something like Julius Caesar or Macbeth? So what kind of story am I writing? Because every story, has a different type of plot, how you build it. So I think there's a lot of books on this. And so my advice would be break it up into those three areas. Uh, research the setting, build your characters, think about your plot. And once you've done that, you will have essentially what an architect does. You will have the blueprint. And before a building goes up, the architect creates a blueprint of the, of the building and says, this is the blueprint. This is how the piping works. This is how the cement works. This is how much brickwork you need. This is how much cladding, this is how much metal. They've done that and then they give that drawing to a builder and then the builder builds the building. So writing is like that. First you have to be the architect, then you have to be the builder. Okay, thank you, Rehan. I've got one more question you can answer. That is from Pfizer. Pfizer okay. Sadiq. Uh, this is what she asks. How easy is it to find your authentic voice as a writer? And how does that add to your writing style? Authentic voice and your writing style. Oh, um, yeah. this is the last question now, okay. Sure, so authentic voice is, uh, it, takes, it takes time. Basically you have to, um, you know, you have to 
first believe that you're a writer by putting in the processes in place. So if I want to be a writer, I should be writing a thousand words a day, you know, when I'm actually writing. Because if I'm not, then I shouldn't call myself a writer. So as you start, you know, doing the hard grind, you start doing the hard work, yeah, you're, you start to sharpen your skill like a craftsperson. A writer is a craftsperson, you know, and like any craft, it takes time, you know. And as you start to build that craft, you don't, don't know, really know what your voice is. But as the, it starts to take shape, you know, like a sculptor starts to shape something, a painter starts to shape something. And as you start to shape the narrative and the words, then your voice starts to emerge. And your voice will only emerge if you take the journey. If you just want to go here and you want to get to the end, you won't, the journey won't release your voice. It's the journey that releases your voice. It's not the outcome. It's not that I wrote a novel. No, that, that's not the point. The point is you have to take the journey. And as you take that journey, your voice emerges. So, you know, for me, uh, my uh, stories, these two stories are about unity. Um, and that's something that's always been important to me in my life, you know, about bringing people together, bringing different people together. For other people, it'll, it'll be something else, right? But you can only do that by taking that journey. And every journey, as um, one of the Chinese philosophers said, every journey starts with one step, right? Even if it's a journey of a thousand miles. Okay, Rehan, thank you so much. Uh, is there anybody who's, who has not spoken and they really would like to ask a, a final just, question? I just would like to say thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, actually, you took me to uh, my two favorite spots, uh, uh, Baghdad and Dubai. Because okay. Baghdad is my origin uh, city. And uh, I spent about 14 years in Dubai. Okay. Yeah. I lived in Dubai from 2004 until uh, 2014. Okay. Then I moved to the UK. It was really interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Loheb. Uh, Rohan, as you will have noticed, Marshall, we are very rich with background. My yes. question is about different background. And because you've spoken about so many countries, so many places, I think it resonates with everybody. And that's what my team has specially said. So, Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed that. So I want to move on to the last bit, which is really uh, the current situation. As you know, we've been through the lockdown, which has affected billions of people around the world in a very negative way. But then we've had another event which has affected us in a positive way, which out of a tragedy of uh, George Floyd's death, we've had the Black Lives Matter movement and I think it's an opportunity we should not miss. So I decided to make this session part of that. And I'm so glad that Rihan did mention some of the historical details relating to Africa as part of this. We also have an event next week, uh, which is, hasn't been advertised yet. We are going to promote it through our mailing list. And we hope that you will join us it was going to be live discussion, as we are, but instead of any presentation, we'll be sharing ideas, we'll be listening to each other, we'll be, you know, sharing of what it's like in other countries. Uh, and it will be done in a very supportive fashion. Nobody has to be afraid of speaking, of being judged. We just share what we know. And that is going to be next Monday at the same time, and everybody can take part. So that's one thing we're definitely doing under Black Lives Matter. Now to finish off this session, I suddenly remember over the weekend that I've written a story myself about black slavery. I'm not a historical fiction writer, unlike Rihan, but I wrote a, a collection of stories which were published over, written over 25 years, uh, years, and they were published in 2017, and four of them were historical fiction. One was, for example, set in Poland about the Holocaust. Another one set in India, Pakistan about the partition of India and Pakistan. Another one set in Peru, 16th century invasion of the Incans. And for all of those, like Rihanna, I had to do a lot of research. I won't go into detail about those stories. The one I really want to pick is the one from called The Slave Catcher. Now this is the book I'm holding to you and the title 
is called The Concubine. The Concubine story is actually the one about the Peruvian invasion, and I won't talk about that. The slave catcher is the one I really want to talk about. Now, people ask me, and I'm sure people ask Rehan, where do you get your ideas from? And we get ideas from different sources. And for this story, I got this idea by chance. I was on a literary tour to US, just finished Arkansas Literature Festival, then I headed up to Chicago, and then I'm heading back to England. And you know what, do you remember the time when we had ash problem over Europe? Everybody, do you remember that time? Ash problem? Yeah. Well, guess what happened? I ended up being stranded in Boston. So instead of coming home to Dublin, and Manchester, the play turned around and we ended in Boston. And I was there stuck for three, four days. So what did I do? Well, of course, like anybody else, I've got to spend my time usefully. So I went around to different places to visit. And one of the places I visited was um, the Slavery Museum. And in fact, it was a museum set in the old school used by the black community. And in that museum, they showed us a film about black slavery. And you know what? As a writer, it's never happened to me before. Within 10 minutes of watching that film, I had the idea for The Slave Catcher. I was horrified at what I'd learned. I knew nothing about American history. I knew very little about black slavery, apart from the famous film, Kunta Kinte. But what I learned was this, Boston is a place where the black slaves from the South escaped to the North. And Boston was the first place where slavery was sort of, you know, stopped. There were free people in that place, in that city. And then what I learned shockingly was the slave owners from the South years later would chase them up to the north with their big ships to catch those slaves. So imagine you have run away as a youth, you are settled there, you have your own family there, you have a good job, you're living as a free family, as a free person, but you still got your great, great forefather owners running to catch you. And that's what I learned. And within 10 minutes, I had this complete idea of the story. So in my story, you have a home of a woman called Lucinda. She is the white woman and she's into freeing slaves. She's supporting black people into freedom. And she has a husband. And then in her house, there are two women, Gwen. She's the housekeeper, the white housekeeper. And then there's a black male called Ayana. Now I'm not gonna tell you what happens in the story because like writers, I want you to read my story. But something happens in the story which makes Gwen sell Ayana to the slave catchers. So I'm going to read to you a very short piece from the scene where poor Ayana has been caught by the field marshals who were called dogs at that time. And Gwen has received the money for her. So I just, it only takes a couple of minutes only. In her bed that night, Gwen relived the scene that afternoon when Mistress Lucinda and Master Kate were out of the house and only she, Ayana, and the young errand boy were at home. No, Gwen, please save me, Ayana had screamed as the field marshal, one of the dogs dragged her out of the house. He manhandled Ayana as she slipped on a slush made by the carriage wheels, badly grazing her hand and squealing in pain, her clothes dripping with icy muddy water. Holding on to his tall hat, the man pushed her roughly from behind, keeping a vice-like grip on her wrist. Two other tall, formally dressed marshal, the dogs, with rifles in their hands, stood waiting beside the carriage ready for action if required. Ayana had thrown another desperate look over her shoulder at the closed door of her employer's house, unable to believe what was happening to her 
that Gwen, the housekeeper, had let the men into the house to drag her away when the kind Mistress Lucinda, who fought so hard for the black folks, was absent from home. Benjamin, the 12-year-old errand boy from the house, who had been sent by Gwen to collect a parcel of tablecloths from Molly's drapery shop, ran up to the man. Hey, where are you taking her, Ayana? Leave her alone, you dogs. Mind your own business, you little brat. We are following the law. Need to return these colored people back to their rightful owners. Anyway, we were invited into your home. What? Benjamin looked aghast, unable to believe his ears. This was the home of Mistress Lucinda, who was fighting to protect black people. Benjamin, run! Go and find Master Kate, Ayana told him, hope gathering in her face. The young boy nodded and sped off. Ayana looked imploringly at the door of Mistress Lucinda's home again before being pushed into the carriage. So I leave it that there, ladies and gentlemen. That's a scene of poor Ayana bundled into a carriage, taken away, the ships waiting in the harbor, and that's it. And that's the reality of what happened. It's a terrible thing to have happened. So I think we've got five minutes left. I'd like to open it up for five minutes, if you don't mind. This was a story. Do you have any experience of other pieces of work, how African, black communities, how they have been portrayed in literature or any books, anything? Anyone? Can I recommend, can I recommend something there? Yes, um, I read, uh, there's quite a few books that come to mind, but one that might be interesting is called The Moors Account. Yeah. That's by Salma Rushdie. We seem to have lost him. Okay, no problem. Is there anybody else want to make any comment about literature, about books, about portrayal? Because we'll talk about other things next week, but today's literature, I just wanted to... Anyone? Uh, I saw one, one beautiful film about slaves named 12 Years Slave. Okay. Very, very nice film, really. If anyone go to see this film it, on YouTube, it's 12 year, Years a Slave. Oh, yes. Did you see, did you see this film? Oh, it's oh, an amazing film. You should, Kesara. Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's very hard to watch, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. The very violence hard. and the yes. abruptness of change. Oh, yeah. yes. The one that sticks in my mind is the one Roots. Do you remember watching Roots, anyone? Old enough to be my age. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Patsy, do you remember Roots? Yes, it was about very Kukin popular. Kukin. That yeah. was my knowledge, my yeah. education about black slavery. Uh, Anyone else? I think what came to mind for me was, um, and particularly with like the statue movement at the moment, um, was Gandhi's writing and Gandhi's racist yeah. literature um, when talking about black people. Um, and I think, you know, that that's brings such an interesting discussion because there's movements all around the world um, tearing down Gandhi st statues. Um, while on the other side, people are trying to put them up at a quicker rate. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really, it's not like a book to recommend, but um, it's just a really interesting change of perspective, which like Rehan demonstrated so well today with his book of just how the story can be shaped. But when it comes back to it, it's so linked. And mm -hmm. so, you know, everybody's had played the, a, um, everybody's played every role almost like, you know, so it's, it's really interesting. Okay, Patsy, you had your hand up. Uh, I think that was from before, but there's been some great novels that have come out of South Africa, I think, that maybe not directly with slavery, but with those issues of power and colour and, uh, or even Maya Angelou's autobiographies yeah. about the impact of being powerless is, is very powerful story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mariam? Any books you recommend or? 
you've mentioned them you mentioned the two of you and Kunta Kinti. The Kunta Kinti one particularly is like my favorite because it happened in um Kunta Kinta is a Gambian slave and I lived in Gambia for like eight years. So like thinking about it that um, this place where it happened in Jamestown, I think I've we've been there before for like a trip and I like we saw the his house um his family's house, the cannons, they so like anytime I remember it, like I just remember going back to the Okay, okay. Okay, we've got three more minutes left before we finish. Anybody else? And can um, everybody write any of their recommendations in the chat so we can copy and paste that in? Yeah, that's a good idea. Recommendation for books you've read or you, we should read, please do. So if there's anybody... Uh, sorry, it's Rehan here. Sorry, I, my, no my laptop died on me. I apologise. <laughs> I didn't realise that Bashi was there. I was going to say... you in your session. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I, I was going to recommend the Moore's account. Yes. Um, and uh, that's uh, by Leila Lalami. Okay. And it's about a, a Moroccan uh, who's taken in the 16th century to La Florida, or, or right. Florida, he's taken around Tampa Bay. And essentially, it's about his story of traveling there with his Spanish masters mm -hmm. and, you know, how they essentially treat the people, Native Americans. So it's a really, really, it was, it was nominated for the, for the, um, uh, Pulitzer Prize. So it's, okay. it's a good book. Excellent. Thank you so account. much. Uh, Jinsilla, make sure we've got that on our list. Okay. Can you Anything type that in the box, please, so we can have I a will. Yeah. I will. Anybody else? Last minute, last comment? Just thank you so much, Rehan. That was, that was really, really fascinating and just mm -hmm. eye opening. And it's, yeah, it was great. I really loved it. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, thank you to our very special guests. And also thank you to our new guests who have joined us. Whether they've come through Rehan or whether they found out about us, we love you to join us next week. Please, again, four o'clock for our special event about Black Lives Matter, open oh. discussions about racism, discrimination, color prejudice. And please, please, it's very, very important. We will send you the information, the invite through, uh, through your mailing list. Those of you who are new guests with us, if you, don't, if you don't have our email, I suggest you look at our MacFest website and we have an email address, hello at macfest.org.uk. You tell us that you want to join us. We will send you the links then, okay? So thank you so much, everyone, and goodbye for now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure.